Hi, everybody. My name is Jesse Lerhoff. I want to welcome everybody to this RISD alumni in an in immersive experience affinity group. I want to remind everybody that this event is being recorded. And I also want to remind everybody that there is a Q&A function to ask questions in the bottom of the screen. We would love to answer your questions. So we encourage you to start asking those and I will go through those a little bit later. Again, my name is Jesse. I am a co-leader of the RISD Alumni and Immersive Experience along with Zach Dekaditz and Josh Inch. We have just launched and we're really excited to host upcoming events to connect RISD alumni in all areas of immersive experience, including AR and VR. I have been working in film production for about 15 or 20 years. And for about the last five years, I've focused on XR, which is, includes VR and AR. And at my previous company, I was working with Luis, who is our guest today. Welcome, Luis. Thank you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Luis Blackaller is a Mexican media artist and filmmaker based in Los Angeles. He has worked with, he has worked as a storyboard artist, a designer, graphic and graphic artist in films like Amoras Peros. 21 Grams and Babel. In 2004, he was invited as a resident artist to the International Studio and Curatorial Program in New York. And in 2006, he joined the MIT Media Lab where he explored the intersection between narrative art, immersive technologies, and pop culture. After graduating from MIT, Luis joined the virtual reality studio Weaver as creative director where he has been developing and producing cutting edge immersive narrative work. He recently started directing independent short films, exploring the vibrant local Zion culture and self-publishing his personal work. He is currently working on location-based experience and virtual production while at the same time developing ideas for serialized television. We're excited to welcome Luis Blackaller. Luis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, uh, hello, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, our homes here in LA. Um, uh, there's a few things I'm very excited to talk about today, uh, but most importantly, I'm really eager to uh, listening to the questions that you might have for me that I can help answer. Uh, my, my, my goal here is to somewhat uh, illustrate what my experience has been uh, navigating this uh, world of uh, nascent immersive media that is still, you know, coming together in some ways. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, first of all, thank uh, Rizvi and Jesse for having me here and then move on to talk about a little bit of what I have been doing for the last few years few years which which will you know unlock a series of other things um, for the last two years and a half or so uh, including the hardcore times of my last year um, I have been working in the project where I was uh, uh, where 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 Jesse was a part of for a little while that uh, is is a very exciting kind of thing that's about to come out of the world, uh, so we can finally talk about it a little bit. And and since you're in Providence, Rhode Island, you're fairly close to it. This 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 location-based virtual reality experiences that we have just finished and are really cool. Uh, are gonna be set up uh, for at, at least a little while, as far as I know, uniquely in New York City. Uh, so it's not so far for any of you to go visit and experience them yourselves and maybe learn a little bit more about uh, the things I say here and why I said them once you can experience these things in, 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 in real life. Uh, these are uh, 
couple of stories that we worked on ex uh, in uh, location-based experience. We had stories that we worked on with Warner Brothers to help expand uh, the wizarding world of Harry Potter. So this is like a really cool, and we're very proud of what we did. And partially, uh, this uh, intellectual property, the story world of Harry Potter, uh, lend itself very well to be expanded by the medium of VR because it's it's just a perfect match to just make the magic happen. You can actually will your one and cast spells and do whatever you want, and you will be able to feel like you're actually there, which gets you back to what really matters about all these media and uh, and why it uh, became interesting to me, even though I somewhat accidentally stumbled upon it as I moved around uh, many different places, which is, um, which is we are surrounded by media today, uh, all these devices that we carry around and uh, we sit with every day and everything. We have media dimming into our eyes all the time. And it's, this media is, it almost feels like it's alive and it's eager to escape the screen and became the world we inhabit in some in, in, in some ways. Uh, and that changes, uh, but not fully, the, the, the way in which as artists we have uh, to craft our work. Uh, we, we, we have been used to think about the stuff we make as things that, you know, most of the times we look at. Uh, or, or we absorb or we consume, but the more the more these things come together, we we can make stuff that that we go and inhabit. So it's 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 crazy when you think about a story, for example, that you were reading a book, um, or you were watching a movie or a TV show or even a theater play, and all of a sudden you can be a part of the story. And this is not something I'm going to be very clear about. That this is not something that is um really uh it, it doesn't require the technology per se right like interactive theater immersive theater has been around for a long time uh, but the technology gives us a extremely broad set of tools that can uh that can that can help us uh put together stuff that uh, in the in the past wouldn't have been imagined. Uh, so uh, uh, to me, uh, I, I, I started up uh, trying to do everything as an artist, just very curious about, you know, photography and writing and filmmaking and animation, and comic books and all that kind of stuff and design as well. And and when 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 computers came about came about as a powerful creative tool in the early to mid '90s, I kind of embraced that stuff, and 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 it helped me a lot uh, work my way into the world of film via production design, which is the task of bringing together the world in which the story happens for the actors, right? It's it's everything from sets and props and set dressing and all those kinds of things. So you have to come up with uh, visual language for all the things that you're putting together that helps the actors bring their story to life on screen. Uh, the funny thing when you do that, right, is uh, the camera comes in and the camera catches the story from uh, very purposely driven uh, gaze of a director, like look at this, look at that, and then editorial puts it together in a way that you can navigate the story. So you don't really see most of the work that goes into production designing the scene per se, all the stuff that's there that is supporting the actors that the camera doesn't need to see, but makes the reality more tangible for the actors that have to be completely uh, immersed in the performances, right? So you know you do that, and and as I'm as I as, as I'm doing that, I'm like more and more enamored of the film medium, filmmaking medium itself. Uh, 
just like make the film and then realizing that all this other stuff supports what's in this rectangle, right? Uh, and at the same time, I start uh, getting more and more and more involved with uh, all these all these digital tools that you're using to make the stuff you make. And, and eventually I ended up just getting very interested in like interactivity and coding as well as uh, filmmaking and that ended up becoming something that when I uh, faced virtual reality uh, kind of like at random and accidentally I was working for a company that all of a sudden decided to do virtual reality only and I realized I was perfectly positioned to explore this medium fully because of my experience as a spatial designer of like sets and stages and stuff like that, my experience as a cartoonist, my experience as a filmmaker and as a interactive media designer. I could think about uh, the potentialities of these medias from like a very fresh perspective because I was not very much kind of like I was very, I was not fully fleshed on any of these other things. So VR has helped me actually kind of bring together a language that incorporates everything in a way that you actually need to use it. And, and we can talk about more in detail about all these things while we go through the questions, I think, just as a source of inspiration. Uh, uh, things to think about that are worth asking is uh, uh, about um, VR as a product versus VR as a tool to make other things. Um, that's that's a, that's a very important distinction. It's 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 catching a lot of importance today uh, in the entertainment industry now. Uh, I can only or mostly talk about uh, what happens with VR or AR or uh, interactive projection mapping, uh, things like that within the um, realm of entertainment because I am not very well versed on how to how these things are used outside of it. I know there are all these other fields, but uh, I I'm, I'm mostly I'm mostly well versed in the world of inter entertainment and, and, and you know the arts a little bit, but uh, that's more or less where I move around. Um, I've been doing VR for about um, nine, eight years, since 2013, 2014. I don't know exactly the date, don't remember it anymore. Um, since pretty much at the day when uh, Facebook purchased uh, Oculus and I have been able to explore the whole range of devices that have been developed all the way from the beginning up until now, and to see how they have uh, struggled and failed or succeeded at becoming consumer products that people embrace or um, a viable forms of expression for artists to like go to film festivals or uh, installations that are open to the public where people go and uh, experience them more as a museum exhibit or like even a theme park ride, right? So all these things I have been uh, related with and I have been working on them, uh, you know, the, from the first headset that were a Samsung cell phone that you would put on a cargo thing to the stuff that we have now where you wear a suit and then you walk into a dark room full of haptics and things like that that respond to your very touch and you feel completely immersed. Um, so I can touch upon all that kind of stuff. Um, how are we doing on time, Jesse? We're doing good. Um, we, we can start asking some Q&A stuff whenever you are ready, but happy to also hear more about your experiences. Yeah, uh, I think the questions and answers themselves will help us talk more about my experiences as well as what I think about things that are related to those. So uh, I, I, I feel pretty good just 
going ahead and starting to uh, talk about questions and answers and things like that. Perfect. I have a few questions that I have uh, come up with myself and I will start with those, but I do encourage you guys to start populating the q and I see a few questions coming in and I'll move on to those shortly. Mm. So the okay. first question you may have sort of already touched in, which is how did you get involved with virtual reality? So I know you touched on that. You sort of fell into it from working with a company, which is Weaver, that decided to go into it fully. Do you have any more to touch on that? How um, you got into the industry? A little, a little bit more detail, right, on that. I think the industry is something that's coming together as we speak. When I started working in VR, I, you couldn't even say there was an industry back then, right? Uh, what, what really happened is uh, I, I, I graduated from the Media Lab at MIT in 2008. And after that, I started thinking about uh, making films um, and moved to LA. And I had all this uh, training, writing uh, code for the web and stuff like that. And the first job I got in LA, I was hired to work on some interactive stuff with this company that I, I said, all right, this is good. I do some like a U, UX type of work, experience design, do some coding. Uh, you know, I'll work on that for a while. It sounds cool. I start doing that. And in the middle of that, uh, uh, Facebook purchased Oculus and the company, which is now called Weaver, uh, had this like pretty cool simulation of life in the oceans, like for you to go to like, you know, a coral reef or the abyss or whatever, right? And because it was made with a game engine, and that's something that's interesting to talk about later on as we uh, continue speaking. It was very easy for the developers in, and that were uh, putting together this project to kind of flip a switch and all of a sudden it was running in a headset. Uh, at the time where there was practically no content and all of a sudden you had a way to explore the oceans in VR fully, right? That became a very relevant thing and inspired the company to steer towards VR. And, and, and then, I, then there it was. And, and I, I was able to say, hey, you know, like I, I, I can do all these things. And, and that kind of got me started. And I think it was a very fortunate position to be because I felt like I was able to grow with the medium in a way. It was, it was very green. It was like, it was like, maybe what you could think about computer graphics in the mid eighties, right? Like it was very difficult to work with. It's a lot easier now. It's still really hard. Now it's like, we're, it reminds me of, you know, like editing videos in the mid nineties, you know, where it was like, you could do Avid and it was a nightmare, you know, <laughs> like kind of thing. You, you needed a lot of training and specialization just to do like something simple thing in visual effects, for example, right back then. And now like everybody can do it on their laptop if they want it. You know? um, so we're still kind of there, it's still difficult, but it was, it was like very difficult a few years ago. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's that. Very interesting. Um, I would love to know how directing and storytelling in VR is different than traditional filmmaking. Yeah, well, that's a, uh, that's uh, fairly easy to identify, right? Because on and, 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 and traditional filmmaking, uh, you are uh, placed in a situation where uh, your focus is completely and 100% driven by someone else, which is whoever put together the edited piece of film that you're watching, right? Even, even when you have some interactive device like a remote control that lets you zap your stuff or whatever, you still focus on watching something that's outside in a different realm. You're like picking into a window where things happen very far away from you, right? You're outside of it. Uh, and you know, there could be interactivity there, especially nowadays, some of those things have been explored. But when you think about something like, something like VR, uh, where you are, uh, where you are 
your whole set of senses gets hijacked so that you get to inhabit the story, then things are gonna happen around you. And this, this very interesting tension gets built between uh, experience and storytelling, right? Between being faithful to fully immerse you in the world, but also being able to like control what you're experiencing so that you can, you know, drive you somewhere or tell you a story. Uh, you know, and, and those are all different modes. So like VR is different in that sense that a perfectly viable VR uh, experience would be some 100% interactive room in which all you do there is hang out, right? And there's no need for story experience can provide for that if it's properly executed. But then you can go along all the way passing to like, you know, something like uh, inspired by video games where it's more like there's tasks and goals and you have to, you know, accomplish things to, to something that's more driven like the experience of a film or like a TV show where like you get to witness something that happens, but you witness it from within it, which makes you part of the story. And that is what changes the things 100%, right? Because even if you don't have any agency to influence where the story is going, like for example, if it was something more related to a film, you're still in it, right? And, and that's something that us as storytellers have to think about it when we craft it, right? We, got, we, have, to, we have to put it together in a way so that if you're looking in any direction, the story still happens to you. And, and the story has to be aware of you being there. And at, at some points, let you feel like you're part of it, even if you're just an innocent bystander that never affects what's actually happening, right? So that's the, 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 the difference, I would say. The difference is between looking at something versus being somewhere. That makes total sense, super interesting. So cool. Oh, I see a lot of questions on the PMA, that's great. Yeah, going. there's some questions coming in. Uh, my next question sort of relates to another question, so I'll read them both. Uh, from one of our attendees, it says, how does an artist who has interest in this field transition into it without a formal education? And I have a similar question, which is like, what is your advice for people that want to learn more about VR and get into the industry? All right. The, the, yeah, the question of a formal education is a, is a tricky one, right? Because uh, a, a, a formal education, and this goes for like every creative field, right? I'm field, uh, right? Like a formal education uh, helps a lot, but it's not required, right? I mean, think about film school and who becomes a filmmaker. It's it's not necessary one or the other or art, art school and who becomes an artist. Yeah, they are related, but if, if you wanna kind of like get your feet wet, say like you're having a formal education on, you know, the, traditional arts at, 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 at like, a, for example, at RISD and, and you wanna get your feet wet and explore how this feels like, then the, the I, I guess the most difficult challenge to bridge is the technical stuff, right? Like being able not just to find what you need, but also being able to use it, right? Uh, uh, something that is a very powerful tool for making certain kinds of VR is uh, game engines. And game engines are beasts, you know. To this date, I haven't been able to even, you know, become an average user at one of them. I, I barely am a beginner. You know, every time I kind of like try to use one, I have to rely on collaborators that know how to use them. Yet I know. I, I know from experience of people that, you know, were going to study, say, what was that school in LA? Uh, one of my collaborators, he's like really good with the Unreal Game Engine and, uh, and uh, he never got any formal training. He picked it up himself just by, you know, looking at tutorials. The tools are free, you know, you just put them in your computer and you can play with them. Uh, and, and, and he was able to, to somewhat master it to a degree that makes him a, a, like a, 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 a very sought after kind of talent, which is somebody that does have an artistic vision and is also able to use these tools. That is very hard to find a lot of times, the people that are very um, 
well versed on these tools are so technical that they sometimes they often lack the artistic vision to be able to explore things beyond uh, just uh, technical constraints. Uh, so uh, I would say Unreal Engine is a very good place to start. And especially if you don't have any experience on any other interactive 3D software, it's great because Unreal Engine is very weird. If you already know, say, how to use like Maya and Unity and all those kinds of things, you go to Unreal Engine and you, like that happened to me. Uh, I'm, I'm used to find all these tools everywhere and for them to be organized a certain way and for them to work this certain way. And then I go to Unreal Engine and it's, it's, it's so different and I get lost. But if I came in without knowing anything, uh, I probably would have had an easier time. You know, uh, I, I, it's the analogy back in the day in the 90s, I, I went to animation school and the tool we were using there is this software called Softimash, Softimash 3.8, which is like weird, weird, weird as hell. And, you know, the first time I was like, you know, coming from things like Photoshop and After Effects and Aldous Page Maker, all those, you know, relics of that era. I was like, what is this? I had a very hard time. Once I broke that barrier of understanding that things were conceptualized differently as a user interface for me to work with them, I became very well versed, but I had to spend one year in animation school to get there, right? It's, it's a time that I can't afford today. Uh, so I did get formal training on that, uh, but it felt like, because I, it's kind of you, you, you learn how to drive an American car, right? And you're really good at driving. And then you go and, you know, this, I'm talking about the before the Cold War when it existed. You, you go and you experience a Russian car, and all the things are in a different place and work different. And you will be clumsy for a while with your driving. So that happens to somebody that already has uh, some practice. Um, uh, but Real Engine is working very hard towards trying to make things very useful to a broad range of talent, which is a powerful concept because these engines were built originally to make video games. And all these media is so much more than video games that they are trying to put together these kind of things that like other people can use. So, well, I don't know if I like went on tangents a little bit too much in that answer, but uh, yeah, happy to follow up later. Yeah, and one of the things, and one of the questions that we're getting is about the engine, somebody just asked. So just to clarify, we're talking about Unreal Engine. It's yes. a game engine that is used uh, a lot in virtual reality. And there's also another game engine called Unity, which is used in virtual reality. So another question is, can you talk about the different VR formats and where you think they're heading? For example, location-based entertainment versus home. And maybe you could explain the difference between those but for people that don't know the difference. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, with the game engines, the most popular ones today are Unreal and uh, Unity. You could pick one or try both. They are both very hard to master. They require some degree of technical like expertise that you will have to, uh, you know, achieve by going through tutorials and practice and all that kind of stuff. Uh, now, in terms of the thing is, like I said, these engines, they are basically interactive, 3D graphics input and output interfaces. What this means is that you get an interactive 3D graphic that you put together. It could be a whole world like where Harry Potter has his adventures or it could be just a Rubik's cube. And then that thing is prepared in a certain way that whether you put it in your phone and you go like this, or you put it in your iPad or you go like this, or you put it in a VR headset and you're only all, all of a sudden there, or you put it on a projector and do some projection mapping and do, do a virtual production shoot. Uh, these engines allow you to prepare your uh, work to be accessible for interactivity to all these devices. And what's very powerful about them is that 
they are fully interactive, right? Uh, in the case of VR, uh, game engines make it possible that you can walk around and interact with objects in the scene, right? Uh, there's other ways of doing different kinds of VR, like the 60 TV and stuff like that, where like you lose that agency. So if you want to have something that looks realistic with a camera, like a film does, you can do that, but it has those limitations that you can't, because it's film, you can't really move around it. There will be a time when we're going to be able to film 3D data and do that, but that's not quite there yet. There's things that kind of work, but then again, doesn't really, I mean, you can make very interesting things, don't get me wrong, and very stylized, very powerful things, but it has a lot of limitations, a lot of constraints, which can work for some, but won't work for everything. Uh, game engines, uh, they don't look like the real world, but they open up what you could think about uh, the universe of 3D animation to full immersion and interactivity. Um, so uh, when, you, when you talk about location-based experiences or room scale VR for the home, those both require content that is fully interactive in that sense that you are able to move around at will in the space. And game engines become then the tool of choice to do that. Like other kinds of software have limitations that wouldn't do that uh, unless you, you know, built your own software or something like that. The game engines really are a very good package that gives you a lot of power. Uh, but they constrain you because they were designed to make video games and they are having a hard time coming out of that bubble to be able to offer more resources to the creative community where there's a lot of people at large, where there's a lot of people that are not necessarily interested in making video games like designers or filmmakers or things like that. But we wanna take a different approach to how things look like or behave or our experience, right? So uh, in that regard, they are kind of like evolving to facilitate that. Um, Location-based experiences, uh, as well as um, the VR at home, um, are probably were probably conceived as uh, business ideas. Which is so? How can I turn this stuff into a product? Right, that's a business question, and and well, you know. A very quick answer to that is let's make a consumer product like you know your iPhone, like something that people can have and take home and use. Uh, that turned out to be very difficult because VR is very green. So to, to to make something that is just compelling for like the regular person to put like basically like a shoebox in front of your eyes and replace all the other stuff you usually do like stare at your phone or watch the television with that became very difficult. It it, it turned out it was taking way longer than what people expected. There are very promising examples of where you could get with that today. Like the Oculus Quest is an excellent consumer device that has a lot of promise, for example. Um, but it became very difficult. And it was not, it was not really delivering in terms of like business uh, to investors and stuff like that. And that's where uh that's where i think it's just a theory right that's where i think the location based experience idea came about which is take the vr out of the consumer product realm so it's not something that you buy in a store and you take it home and it becomes more of a thing that you go visit and pay for like going to a museum or going to the movies and then and then then what happens there is you have way more control over the user experience because they are going to go in there and use whatever devices were put together there. So, you know, you don't have to take all these considerations that will have to be taken for like a consumer device. Like for example, uh, in order to like have really good detail and high fidelity in VR, you, you need extremely beefy computers to run the graphic cycles, right? Um, most people will never have a computer like that at their home ever. And then even if they do, then you have all these cables and stuff, right? So it becomes this like 
crazy contraption out of a cyberpunk novel, which is very difficult for people to just, you know, not care about, but enjoy, like you do with a consumer product, right? Who really thinks about whatever my cell phone is doing right now? Nobody. Uh, so in order to shrink that, the mobile phones came about as the screen for this kind of headset, but mobile phones are way less powerful. So it means the thing. It took a lot of time to get to something like the Oculus Quest, which delivers on some kind of promise for that. Uh, but when you're in a location-based experience, you can really put all that stuff in there because the 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 transaction with the with 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 your consumer is not that they are gonna buy a device is that they are gonna go there to experience a spectacle or an exhibition or something like that and you can have as beefy a computer as you want within those set of constraints and then backpacks came about and and different setups for like rooms in which you could wander in a completely different manner right that's another thing when you have a vr device at home the the solution to the problem of I put on the device and now the world around me is not matching my VR so I can stumble upon my desk or whatever, you know, like becomes a problem that needs a solution that's very hard. We'll get there eventually. AR and VR will become the same thing in some way. Um, um, but in the location-based scenario, that problem does not exist because you build the room to match what the VR is doing. And, and you can actually build the room as a sort of a Rube Goldberg machine or a Rubik's cube where it changes as people are wandering through it and supports whatever experience they are having. So that when you lean in in VR to open that door, the door is actually door there and opens, right? And you can do that. And it becomes a completely different thing. It's more of a, it just becomes this kind of like haunted house, theme park, right? Like, movie slash interactive theater kind of experience in some way. It can be thought of about th that way. And then and then you just have to have like people going through it all the time and you know the business people are happy. So that's kind of like the difference between those two and what I think the reason is for location based experiences was to uh, emerge, right? Um, there, there you go. I think that was enough for that one. <laughs> Very cool. And we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll try to get through as many as we yeah, can yeah. with the time remaining. That's great, yeah. So from Joe, he asked, how interactive are your works? Are they 360 movies the audience takes in passively or do they manipulate things with their hands? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I have explored the whole range or gamut of like interactivity in VR, uh, all the way from a 360 video where you just, you know, sit and watch it to interactive 360 videos where like you sit and watch, but you can also like drive the story by what you pay attention to on the on the on the scene or where, where there are hot so hot spots where you can like basically teleport to say a building and experience the story. Uh, basically you you become your own by doing that you become your own editor of like what you experience and the story has to be told in this in this way that uh, we call multi-dimensional storytelling uh, where like you can experience multiple different stories because they're all the same story and they all end at the same place at the end or something like that uh, to different different amounts of uh, interactivity using the game engines uh, once you step away from the 360 video, then you can have way more interactivity. You can move through the space, and then, and then, and then it it really depends on the concept of the work that you are trying to execute. How much interactivity is required, right? Um, you the, you will need, and and this is something that we've done. You will need. Uh, a lot of interactivity if your goal is to be left in a room where you have to explore all the objects in that room to solve a puzzle and get out of it, right? And you will need a different kind of interactivity when you are in a location-based experience, for example, where you are allowed 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes, to go from the beginning to the end of the experience, and you have to come out of it with a sense of like something happened that is part of a story, right? So in that case, there is a lot of interactivity, 
but your agency is more limited. It doesn't matter what you do. The thing will happen to you in 10 minutes, no matter what. Yet the interactivity is very powerful because in a location-based experience, you can feel everything, right? Like if there's, say, a dragon in the room breathing fire on you, you will feel the fire, which is something crazy and very powerful. Or if you go into an elevator that all of a sudden the cables break and falls down real quick, you're going to feel all that in your feet. So uh, that's a kind of interactivity that's very powerful, yet like you don't know much about it. You can press the button of the elevator, that's about it, right? But it is interactive, even though there's, it doesn't really matter what you do. Uh, I, I think that's a good question. So the answer, I guess, is uh, I've explored all, I have a lot of different ranges of interactivity from zero to total. Awesome. I like them all. I, the passive stuff is really nice sometimes. Definitely. And the project that we worked on recently had a lot of interactivity. Uh, you know, you could feel things, you can. That's the difference between location-based VR, where you can actually install things in a space that you interactive while you're in VR. So it's really interesting right. to be able to experience that. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next question. Where do you think VR will go in the near future as well as the technology? Is it going to be off goggle? Will it, would it be more mainstream? And that question comes from Esther. Um, yeah, well, I hope it goes off goggle, but you know, how to accomplish that? It's very difficult to imagine. Um, I had an opportunity to work as a creative director on a project uh, that was funded by uh, Paul Allen called the Holodome, who, which the which which the the dream was to make something you know like the X Men Danger Room or the Star Trek Holodeck, like a room where you walk into and all of a sudden you are in the you know Peruvian rainforest or you know the Louvre or whatever, right? And and it 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 sounds like you know ultimate VR in some way, uh, and and we 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 work on that with uh, interactive projection mapping, uh, like where it, they did a pretty good job at the technical stuff where like there was an array of projectors on top. The room was like a bubble about 20 feet, like 20 feet diameter more or less. And the projectors were set in some way so that the, the floor was part of the projection. Uh, so as long as you were kind of like in the sweet spot, the illusion was almost perfect and it was interactive so you could you could interact with the stuff but if you got too close to it it would break you know if if it's things like that so it, it was not there yet and like it's hard to imagine there's gonna be something like that on until there's something like holograms you know um, there's also science fiction writers have speculated about well you know it's a headset now but could it be contact lenses one day and then it's kind of like well, you know, it could embed things in the real world, like AR style, and then you will see the stuff merged together. So I don't know where all that is going, if it ever will happen. Uh, whether some, some, some of this stuff will go mainstream or not, I think so. I think the, the Oculus Quest is a very good promise of that. Uh, it, it has a lot of stuff that, uh, it, it just works. Uh, as a, something that could go mainstream, like the different kind of uh, applications. It turns out that you know one of the trending uh, one of the trending app categories on the Quest is fitness. Like you put the thing and and then you go to like a yoga class or something like that. And I mean, I I haven't done it uh, honestly, but I I can see how that could work. You know, boxing sounds great. Box training, oof, you know uh floyd mayweather there you go uh at, in your room uh so i do think it will go mainstream now there was a part of that question that had to do with uh, production or something like that right uh but i'm not i don't remember exactly well there's there's this thing where vr is a very powerful tool for creators that don't make vr like as a as a traditional filmmaker 
uh, I could benefit a lot from it if I'm working in animation or visual effects because I could I could I could get and this is something that we actually did a little bit of that uh, recently for the uh, Harry Potter project. I'm not gonna be able to tell you the details about this because it will spoil the experience, and I'm not allowed to do that. But uh, but imagine you are an actor that is performing a character that is going through like a sequence of actions uh, that involves a bunch of monsters that can't exist, right? So you're an actor and you have to go into the dungeon where like all the dragons live or whatever, right? And, and then you have to interact with them in all these crazy ways. Uh, you usually do that when you look at, you know, like blockbuster films and how they do that, it's like, uh, not only super expensive, but also you have to have these actors like just in, surrounded by a green screen wearing these like motion capture suits. It co looks completely insane, right? So I can't imagine what the actor has to go through just to imagine that that thing over there that somebody is waving with their arms is actually the head of a dragon that's about to eat them and then act accordingly. But if you if you if you already have like a prototype of this. Uh, creature and and you put the actor on a VR headset, you can have them actually interact with that creature and 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 feel like they are there. Furthermore, you can actually grab a virtual camera and film that stuff inside the space where the dragon is, rather than in the green place. And all that data gets saved, and then like it saves us a ton of time in like uh, visual effects uh, pipeline and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very powerful tool to use. Or making other things as well. So it can be a product and it can be a medium that supports the expression of artistic forms, uh, but it can also be a tool to make other things that are not it, which is a very powerful thing. And, you know, going back to like the game engines are crucial to all these because uh, right now, today, the backbone that makes it happen, that, that really runs that level of interactivity. Awesome. Um, I think we only have time for one or two more questions. There's a lot of questions about Unreal. So I'm going to read a few of them and see if we can sort of touch on a few of them at once. One was a question uh, from. Before you go ahead, uh, let me interrupt you for a moment. Uh, sure. Something that we can do that I have no problem doing is, you know, I love it that there's so many questions and we can have a follow up message the, where I can take the time to write them down, add links and stuff like that. And it will be very helpful for everybody that's asking these questions uh, that might require more practical answers to do that if we don't get the time to go through all of them because we're, you're right, 10 minutes away and I sometimes. Perfect. And yes, I'm sure everybody would that, enjoy like that. Just make sure you save them and I'll go through the trouble of writing them for all of them and send them back. It Perfect. Be, it will be a pleasure. Well, then, because some people are asking about specifics, like, uh, you know, what game engines they need training on and this, that, I think we'll save that for afterwards. Elise asked, how do you feel about AR and its use as an interactive experience? Uh, well, like, like uh, I, I think I touched upon that a little bit before when answering something else. So I'm gonna try to elaborate about that a little more, which is, uh, you know, as labels AR and VR are two aspects of the same thing, right? And I think they are evolving in parallel to a place where, 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 where they will meet when, basically when the hardware is good enough to allow them to do so. Uh, brings up another powerful uh, tool set for exploring all these kinds of things um, that is interesting to think about, which is the uh, Apple stuff, the AR kit stuff, and their whole thing they have with the emoji and all that kind of stuff. It's very interesting. The, and Snapchat. They have some, the Snap people have some like pretty cool creative tools that are completely different from anything else. And they are, they are doing a really good job 
at you know embedding uh, digital alterations into the real world, like the way they capture facial expressions and are able to map design stuff to them is crazy. Uh, so it's 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 it, this is not for the VR, but it's also very interesting to look into. Uh, is the, the the what Snap is doing the creative tools? You can download them and they work on any computer, Windows or Mac or whatever. And you can just start making AR filters right away. It 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 gives you kind of like an additional window to where these things are heading heading and um, this like embodiment of you know the digital realm or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the Apple stuff is also very interesting. It's uh it's uh somehow merged together with the with the game engine stuff. Uh, I haven't I haven't been using a Unity for a couple of years because the project that I was completely immersed on for the last two years was completely unreal. I, I did to use I did use to use uh, Unity before. In my experience I find it easier to use than Unreal, but they are different. Uh, yet they are I mean you can just choose one or try both. It, it doesn't really uh, matter that much, but uh, but what I do know is that there's some integration with like Apple's AR kit motion capture technologies into the Unreal Engine that allows you to drive, say, virtual characters in real time using the iPhone lidar camera and the uh, blend shapes for the facial expressions that. Uh, pre-coded within the Apple ARKit system and they do a like really good job. Something that we've, we've done recently in production is, you know, animation is very hard and takes a lot of time. Uh, motion capture technologies in some cases help you get there uh, without that much effort and with less time. And it also, they also bring a certain level to realism that certain level of realism that helps certain production. So different animation is still the best, all right, but motion capture helps for certain things. Um, and we learned that uh, just using a regular PC and an iPhone, connecting it to the, it's called Lightlink. It's a system that Unreal Engine has to drive virtual characters in real time. You can, you can have an actor uh, perform the expressions of your character. You know, the character is doing all these things, going through all these animations, having all these expressions. The phone maps in real time to the character. You can see them, and that's not your final animation, but it gives you a blueprint to, from which you can uh, then uh, proceed to add more detail and nuance to the performance, and it saves you a ton of time. And and that's. The Lightning setup with an iPhone, any computer, and a real engine is something that if if you take the trouble to go through it, you're probably three to four YouTube videos away from doing it right now. If you have a computer and an iPhone, uh, an iPhone with the LiDAR camera. So it's 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 interesting, right? Uh, that's it. I, uh, that's it for that one, I think. Thank you. Um, we are really running close on time. I don't know if we have time for another question, but maybe we could talk a little bit about how students can make their own VR and what they might need in terms of crew or equipment. Well, for VR, you will need a headset. Uh, the headset of your choice will come with a set of different requirements for how you put together the software that's going to run on it. And the software is usually made with a uh, game engine, right? Unity or Unreal. Um, that will give you like a lot of interactivity. If you want to go for very interactive, you need that. If, if you want to explore the world of 360 video, then you need a 360 camera and just only a headset, right? Um, so the headset of choice depends again on what you want to do. Um, there's a range of them and some of them have cables some of them don't some of them require beefy computers some of them don't uh, uh the quest might be the friendliest proposition right now i am not sure in terms of like allowing you to make things and look at them 
uh, there's a really, and, and then again, it depends on what you want to do, right? Uh, sometimes the simpler things could be the things that you are willing to explore, like maybe just, you know, you're really into figuring out how to flip a coin and then all you need is a like really flat cylinder and figure out the physics of that, right? And But then you need a headset that is really good at hand tracking, right? All these things come to place. The hand tracking in the Oculus Quest is better than anything I've seen uh, elsewhere. And this is not a commercial, it's just true. There's, uh, if you Google, and then again, I can send links to all these. If you Google, I'm not a fan of the Quest because of Facebook to tell you the truth, but if you Google, if, if, if you Google Hans Physics Lab, no, Hans Physics Lab, Lab, sorry about that. Hans Physics Lab, there's these people in Switzerland, they focus on like the Quest has a bunch of cameras that point outwards that helps it see what around it and it's getting to that direction in which the VR will somewhat match the reality. You know, having a body is very important. The, the Quest is probably the only, the only consumer level device that does a great job at that. It's really good at hand tracking. These hand physics labs people, you see the graphics, they're extremely simplified to the minimum because the Quest is still running on what's basically a mobile phone. So it cannot really give you realism, but they focused entirely on hands and interaction with objects in virtual reality and to make it feel as close as possible as you know when you grab something and you stomp into it right and it's just great it's i found it very inspiring of an example for where things could you know go uh another headset like the like 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 the vibe of the playstation you need you need to be holding a track here to do things right that limits you in some way um there you go very interesting. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I have written down the questions and we will send up a follow up email with some links and answers to everybody's questions. We want to thank Luis Blackaller so much for being with us today and answering our questions and sharing his experience. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here and asking so many questions. That is very inspiring to me that there are so many questions around this. Happy to answer all of them if I can, as best as I can. And uh, we'll do it in a written format uh, following up. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And we just want to encourage all alumni to get involved and stay in touch. <laughs>